start. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. So today we'll um, cover now a presentation about how we looked at containers at CERN and the CERN cloud. Uh, so I'll, I'm Ricardo from, from the CERN cloud team. And, and hi, I'm Adrian Otto. I'm the team lead for the Magnum project. So we'll go through this. This, this was a collaboration between uh, uh, the CERN Open Lab, uh, which is a, um, um, a group we have at CERN that collaborates with external entities and also Rackspace. Uh, so I'll give a brief introduction to CERN, just to explain why, why we are looking at this in, for our use cases. So CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. It was founded in 54. It has 22 member states, but actually a, a, a series of other associate members that also uh, contribute to the different experiments we run. So we're basically a, a particle physics laboratory. We do fundamental research in the area of uh, particle physics. And uh, the main things we have right now, it's uh, accelerators, uh, physics accelerators. So you can see a picture on the bottom left there of uh, our main one, which is called the Large Hadron Collider. So it's and, uh, under 100 meters underground, and uh, we accelerate uh, protons uh, up to the speed of light, and we make them collide at specific points. So with the picture in the middle, you see how this, uh, this uh, complex works. So you can see we have multiple accelerators. Some of them uh, start the proton acceleration, and then we go to the ma main one. So the accelerator, the big one, is 27 kilometers uh, uh, perimeter. Uh, 100 meters underground, and then in certain points, we have uh, dedicated experiments looking at different uh, um, parts of physics. And this, is, this picture on the bottom right is from the Atlas experiment, which is one of the biggest ones. I don't know if you can actually see, but there's uh, like a, a human-sized uh, person there, so you can see the scale of it. So it's a cavern of 60 meters high, uh, 100 meters underground. So we, we, make, we accelerate these particles up to the speed of light, and then we make them uh, colliding against each other, and we try to analyze what comes out of these collisions. So what comes out in, in general is a lot of data that we have to store and analyze. So for this, we use a, a large OpenStack cloud. So this is a screenshot I did yesterday of our current state. So we have something like 250,000 cores available. Uh, we have uh, almost 8,000 hypervisors. We use OpenStack uh, Nova cells to split the load. And the interesting bits here, so 26,000 VMs, on, more or less, but the interesting bit here for this presentation is the Magnum clusters there. So you can see that uh, even if it's an early project, we already have uh, quite a bit of deployment. So we have around 80, 80 clusters uh, available right now. So with this, uh, we'll start with the presentation of the Magnum project, just as con context for, for this talk. And I'll pass to Adrian. Thanks, Ricardo. <clears throat> So Magnum is an, uh, an OpenStack service that allows you to, as a cloud user, produce a cluster that runs a container orchestration engine. And it allows you to use your existing cloud credentials in order to produce those clusters. So if you're already an OpenStack user and creating VMs or volumes or, or other cloud resources, you can use the same account that you use to produce those to produce these clusters you get a, to choose which kind of cluster you create because the actual back end for this is modular. So there's a driver for Kubernetes, there's one for DCOS, we'll talk about these in a minute. There's also a multi-tenancy solution. So you can have clusters that are side by side of the same type, of, the, of a different type, but that are guaranteed never to share the same kernel with each other, which is important for security isolation reasons. So because of the way that Magnum works, you get multi-tenancy not just at the control plane, uh, which you might be uh, accustomed to with your, with your favorite container orchestration system, but all the way down through the entire cloud. So it's using all of, all of OpenStack's features for multi-tenancy and then implements its own. I find it convenient to use Magnum to create clusters really fast. Any of you that have ever tried to stand up a multi-master Kubernetes cluster on your own using scripts might recognize that that is not an easy process. So being able to just ask a, an API service to get a cluster right away um, is extremely compelling. So when we talk about 
Magnum and CERN's use of it, we're going to use some terminology that you need to know. Uh, the first is a COE. A COE is a container orchestration engine. So this is, well, I, I mentioned before, this is modular. So we support Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, Mesos, and DCOS today. And because this is modular, we can support others in the future. And the reason why we need a term for this and other um, container orchestration solutions don't use this term is because OpenStack is the only cloud environment that gives you a choice. We also have a concept called a Magnum cluster. So a Magnum cluster is represented in the, in the Magnum service as an API resource. So just like when you create a server in Nova, uh, and you can represent and, and query that through the API. You, when you create a cluster, it is also an entity that's an API resource. And that resource is backed by a heat stack that contains all of the cloud resources necessary to bring that cluster up. So it's all of the Nova instances, the Neutron networks, the security groups, the software configuration components, um, everything that's necessary in order to produce and manage that cluster is contained in a, in a heat stack. Now, once you have the, a Magnum cluster, you can act on it for, to manage its life cycle. So, you, of course, you can create it, you can scale them, um, you can act on them. We're working on getting in-place upgrades, which is kind of a very handy thing to have um, if you've got a giant cluster and you want to be able to um, upgrade it in place rather than make a whole new one and redeploy your workload onto a, onto a new cluster. And the Magnum cluster is the place where the COE software actually runs. So here pictured at the bottom, you see the Magnum clusters in the middle, the COEs are running on those clusters, and they are composed of a, an elastic composition of cloud resources underneath. So you can determine how many Nova servers are in a cluster. You can determine um, the scale of it in that way. There's also a concept of a cluster template, which is a little bit different than a, um, a heat template. If you understand how a heat template works, it's a file artifact, right? A, an HOT file artifact that you present to the orchestration service in order to produce a stack. And the, um, the disadvantage of that model is that it's not represented in a way that's reusable by all of your users of your cloud. Every user needs to have his or her own file artifact in order to produce the stack. In this case, it's actually represented as a, as a resource in the API. So the administrator of the cloud can produce one of these things and have it saved as a public resource, and then all of the users of that cloud can use it in order to produce clusters that match that form. And then the last bit of terminology is native client. So Magnum is not designed to be a container orchestrator. It is designed to be a service that gives you an environment of your choice, and you're going to use the native tools that belong to that orchestration tool. So we, taught, we defined what a COE is. Each COE has clients that are designed to work with it. So if you're using Docker Swarm, the client is Docker. If you're using Kubernetes, the client is kubectl, right? If you're using Mesos, it has its own client. You don't have to use an OpenStack client in order to interact with these, um, with these environments. You're going to use the native client. And that represents a, an interesting problem because you have to, when you're running native client, you need to use whatever its native um, authorization and authentication mechanisms are. They're not integrated with OpenStack Keystone, for example. So how do you manage that from a, from a, a user perspective and from a security perspective? It's a different mode. And so Magnum bridges that gap by managing all of the TLS certificates that are necessary for doing that. So Magnum is different from running uh, a system like Kubernetes uh, by itself in a few ways. So first, I talked about multi-tenancy. Most people don't realize that today, container orchestration systems do not have multi-tenancy in their network. Just does not exist and probably will not exist for some time. Um, when you use Magnum to deploy your, your container orchestration environments, you're getting multi-tenancy because Neutron is multi-tenant. And so you get that isolation between, uh, between deployments that you, uh, you wouldn't get otherwise. 
you get to choose whether you want to run um, like for Swarm for some workloads, Kubernetes for others. CERN is going to talk about their, their interest in having this as a choice for their, their scientists. You also get to choose what kind of, uh, what kind of server gets, on, gets put underneath this. So if you want this on top of virtualization, great. If you want it on top of bare metal, that's fine too. And it's also integrated with OpenStack in the way that I described before, where you use the same, uh, the same identity in order to interact with the cloud. Yep, thank you. So I'll build on this. So um, when, we, when we started looking at this, it was mostly because we saw an opportunity here on using containers to simplify our procedures and to help our users on having more flexible ways of doing their data analysis. In the end, what we are uh, producing, as I mentioned before, is a lot of data. We, we produce some tens of petabytes a year. Uh, we have a couple of hundred petabytes available that we need to process uh, from time to time, and c always new data coming. So we, we try to improve uh, our procedures constantly. So containers gives a, give us a, a better way of doing that, but it, they also give other things. Um, the sharing of the experience of uh, running an analysis, the ability to reproduce that analysis. And this is what I'll try to cover here. So if we look at it, um, a container gives you isolation, kernel namespace, C groups. It gives you uh, the possibility of having improve, improved performance because you're sharing the same kernel instead of uh, traditional VMs. And then um, the ease of use. And this, these things will be clear from our use cases. So a bit of the timeline of um, how we, what was our uh, process to get to where we are today. So if we look at uh, what um, was available at the time, we started some container investigations of what was available, which uh, tools w w were there. And uh, we started this end of 2015. Uh, Magnum uh, was already there. So we started a, a set of early tests beginning of 2016. And we saw potential to uh, offer what we needed. We already have a big OpenStack cloud, so building on top of an OpenStack service makes our life much easier. Uh, Magnum also had the possibility of choosing the container engine. This was very important for us because we had groups of people that were uh, pushing for Kubernetes. We had uh, groups of people that were already using Mesos and others that were just using plain Docker, and they wanted to rely on the Docker API, and Swarm there has a, a great potential. We wanted also that this is easy to use, so that people don't have to understand uh, complicated templates of how to con configure their, uh, their uh, clusters. So we, we, in 2016, we worked a lot with the Magnum team, also upstream. Um, and we worked on integration of the missing bits uh, on the, the wall setup that relate to our specifics in, the, in our infrastructure. Uh, we, this took a couple of months, and by the end of last year, actually October, we opened the service to all, all the users. And, um, it's been quite popular until now. So an example usage, uh, Adrian described really well the concepts of wh what is in Magnum, and this is how we use it uh, at CERN. So this is what a, a user will see. They will do Magnum cluster template list, and they will see the possibilities of which systems they can deploy. So for the three systems we, we, we described, we have what we call production templates, and we have what we call preview te templates. This is a really good thing because it allows us to deploy to the end users the next version of, of the configuration. And they, if they want to try it, like if we integrate with a new storage system and, they want to, to, and we want to expose this to users, then they can just try a template with this preview, uh, cluster with this preview templates and get an early view of what's coming and give us feedback. So this is really good. Then inside the template, you can see what is there. So you have the COE, which is the main part but you also have uh, specific, specific configurations of how large your masters should be, how many masters, uh, how large your nodes should be, where the containers are run, uh, what kind of server, uh, VM or bare metal. The image ID is actually controlled by us. Uh, we, we only support Fedora Atomic for now. Um, then the network driver is also controlled by us. But this is important. For example, if you consider a small cluster of, say, five nodes, then probably a master of medium size is enough. But if you st start scaling to a couple of hundred uh, or thousands of nodes, then you will need probably much larger masters. And this is what we experienced. So users have these default templates, but they can actually customize to their needs. Uh, so 
this is all they need to do to create a cluster. Well, when I meant fast and easy to use, this is what we were looking for. So instead of understanding complicated setups and templates, all they have to do is a command that they are very familiar with because it's uh, configured using the usual OpenStack credentials. So they say cluster create, they give it a name, they select the template they want to use and the size of the cluster. And after a couple of minutes, they will have the cluster available. And then we have this cluster config, which is the one that does all the fiddling on the client side so that you can use the native client. So if you're using Kubernetes, then this mag magnum cluster config will actually set up the Kubernetes configuration file so that you just use kubectl and it just works. If you use Swarm, then it will configure the Docker host environment uh, variable and things like this. So this is very simple. And if some, some of our users had tried the, the Google container engine, for example, and they feel uh, the same kind of experience here. So this is what we were looking for. So the second step was to make sure before we opened to users that we could scale to our size, to the, the use cases we have. So some of these uh, use cases can be quite large. So if you have to process a couple of petabytes of data, you might want a very large cluster. So we, t we started stress testing and we, we built on um, some stress tests that the Google team had developed for Kubernetes and we tried to reproduce mid last year. And we for this purpose, we deployed a cluster of 1,000 nodes and we managed to have their test service scaling to 7 million requests a second. The initial goal was 10 million. We didn't quite reach it because of some networking uh, issues we had internally. Uh, but we are pretty confident that we could have reached it without that. The second thing we did is um, how, how well does the creation of the cluster scale for different sizes? So here you have an example on the table on the left. Um, and here you can see that we tried from pretty small clusters of two nodes where it takes like two and a half minutes. And then we went to 128 nodes and we saw that actually the time doesn't increase that much. It's still around five minutes, which is acceptable. Then we went further up and we tried 512 and 1,000 nodes, so pretty large clusters. And we started seeing some kind of linear scaling. So um, we, we are working on improving this because there is no obvious reason why this should happen. But still, like, for most of our users, or all of them actually, uh, if they really need a thousand node clusters, 23 minutes is something they're, they're willing to wait for uh, to get a large cluster like this. So in the end, the, it proved that this kind of technology, we can really scale to, uh, in the Kubernetes example, we can see seven million requ requests a second with 10,000 uh, pods generating loads and 500 uh, replicas of an engine server, and the system just keeps going, so it was quite good. And then the, at the same time, we were doing some integration work. So if you deploy these kind of clusters in a large organization like ours, we have a lot of legacy systems. So the data comes from the detectors, but it goes to our storage systems. And these storage systems have been there. There are hundreds of petabytes of data available, and that's what they need to access. So we have to make sure that when they deploy their clusters and then when they run, run their workloads on containers, that they actually get um, uh, access to all of this. So in our case, there's two systems that I'll briefly mention here. The first one is called CVMFS, which stands for CERN VM file system. Uh, this is a, mostly a read-only um, system that we use for distributing software in many distributed sites in, um, in around the world. And it's basically a caching, a uh, web caching uh, of this, uh, this data. Uh, so this is accessible as read-only using a Fuse plugin. So we had to make sure that this is well integrated into Magnum in, and in our configuration. Uh, so th this, uh, you can find the links below of how we did this. The way we did it is we wrote a Docker volume plugin uh, that exposes this, uh, this uh, file system to, to the container using the Docker interface. And I'll give an example. Um, the second one is EOS, which is where all, all our physics data is. This is a bit more complicated to configure because it actually needs credentials, user credentials. Um, so they support Kerberos and X Web and certificates. It's also a Fuse plugin, but it's slightly more complicated. So for Swarm and Mesos, we just use the plain Docker volume plugin. And for Kubernetes, we did a flex volume wrapper that uses the same code behind. So the way this looks is if you're used to Docker, uh, you usually create a local volume uh, and it puts some storage on the host. So in this case, you just say Docker volume create 
and then you get, give the repository of the, the CVMFS uh, uh, in the CVMFS file system, and this will do all the fiddling for you on the host configuration. And then when you deploy, in this case, I'm just deploying a normal shell in an interactive uh, container. Um, and you just reference that, that, that repo, and it will be available for you inside the container. Then if you look for Kubernetes, it looks exactly the same. So just different manifest, but the configuration is exactly the same. And internally, it will work the same. So th this abstraction is, is really good, because um, we have a lot of users using Docker, but then they need access to these systems. And the configuration is not always trivial. The fact that we could centralize all of this in one service within OpenStack in Magnum uh, is really a, a very good feature. And we have some users that instead of just using Docker on their host, they actually deploy a single node or two node cluster because they get all this configuration for free and they don't have to do anything. So this was more the internals. Now I'll cover a bit the use cases uh, of where we are currently using uh, uh, containers extensively. So I'll cover two, which are more infrastructure oriented. So we use GitLab for most of our code repositories, and we use GitLab continuous integration very extensively for many, many components. So the builds, uh, when, you, when you're using continuous integration, some of these builds can be just building software. Some of the builds are really validating physics software, which can be several gigabytes and take a long time. So the runners the, behind this infrastructure are uh, heavily loaded, and we have to be able to scale very easy, easily. So we have some predefined shared runners, which is the standard configuration that you would get with, um, with GitLab CI. And these are also running Docker, Docker, but there's no specific configuration. So if you need something special for your runners, you won't get it here. What we provide instead is the ability for people to define their own runners, which can, comes with GitLab CI. But then you might, it might be complicated to, to set them up. So what we've done is uh, we integrated this with, uh, with our uh, Magnum service. So when you, you, when you need these special configurations, you just deploy, uh, in this case, a Docker Swarm cluster, and you start running your jobs, uh, your GitLab CI jobs, within your tenant in your cluster, uh, in a Swarm cluster. This works very well because GitLab CI has very good integration with Docker, and it uses Docker API. So if you, instead of running a single instance of Docker, Docker on a host, you just point to a Swarm cluster, then it just works. And if you have periods of high load, you just scale the cluster. So this is another functionality that Magnum allows you. You can just change the number of nodes in your cluster from, say, 5 to 10 for a while, and then you shrink it again when you don't need it, and you just play with your quota uh, as you need. So the second one is Horizon. So we use OpenStack everywhere. So uh, we, we wanted to see how, how far we were from being able to run actual services in containers. So in this case, we took Horizon um, as an example. So traditionally, we deploy everything uh, managed by Puppet and centrally managed. So we have a Foreman database that keeps track of all the hosts. And uh, we have profiles for how the host sh should look like. This works very well, but it sometimes doesn't give us the flexibility we would like. Uh, so we started looking at moving all of this to containers. So there's a lot of talks uh, uh, during the summit about how to do this and different options. In our case, because we had Magnum, so we deployed the Kubernetes uh, cluster. And we did all the configuration of Horizon um, in, uh, in to, to be deployed in Kubernetes. So we, we built some Docker images and all of this. And it works really well. And what it allows us is when we have periods uh, where we need to scale the service, then it's much easier to scale uh, pods in Kubernetes than it's to scale VMs. Uh, it's just faster and uh, takes less, less resources. We did discover a couple of things that we are working on. Um, with the current OpenStack service, it's not completely trivial how to get configuration uh, other than using the local files. So we actually use a uh, um, distributed file system to share the configuration between all the instances. And the second one is how to get the secrets. Uh, both Swarm and Kubernetes have the possibility of um, storing secrets for your service, and the service can use them. But how we get those secrets there is not clear. So we have a secret uh, service, secret storage service, uh, turn, 
uh, where we put all the passwords and all the things, and how to do this integration and plug them into the, the um, engines is not completely trivial. So this is something we are working on, and there's work upstream in those projects also to help. And then I go to the coolest one. So in the end, we are a physics laboratory. What we want is to, to do um, a physics analysis and get some results. Uh, from all this infrastructure we have, from all these uh, complicated instruments we have, the cloud, in the end what we have is plots. Uh, it's, this is what physicists are working for. And in, I give two examples here. So the one below on the left, this is the, from the Atlas experiment. It's a plot of the, a couple of years ago we discovered a new particle um, called the Higgs boson that had been predicted many years ago. So you can see there the plot where they finally found uh, the particle, and it's just a histogram like this, and you see a pike, and that's, that's the particle. So this is the result of the analyzing petabytes of data for many, many years. And then we have like future physics that might come, and these are other plots on the right. But this is what people actually do uh, when, they're, when they're working with this data. Now, one of the problems we have is that sometimes it's not very trivial to share this analysis. Um, so uh, if, you, if you're doing this work and you want to share it with a colleague, uh, sometimes the setup of, of this analysis can be very complex. There's a lot of software, a lot of dependencies on where to fetch the data, what to run, which version of the software to use. And this is where containers also help a lot because physicists can just build this environment in one single unit and then say to people, just reuse this. And this is a, a really, really big benefit of using containers. So again, as I mentioned, so this analysis has multiple pieces, and I mentioned the data. Uh, even the data can be multiple types. We can have the raw data coming from the detector, but we can also have different uh, steps of reconstruction of this data, and we do a lot of simulation. Um, and then the frameworks that use the software that have different releases, versions, and you have to make sure that this analysis is run with that version of the software. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. So being able to define one single unit where all this is contained, the software, the dependencies, everything, is, is a very big benefit. The other thing is that the computing is massively distributed at CERN. So if you manage to do something in your corner, it doesn't, if you need to scale, it's not very trivial to just now run this in 1,000 nodes. It's not that trivial. If you define it in a container in one unit, then you just say, run this container and scale it to 10,000. Uh, instances. So this is also very important. So in, in, in the end, having this single unit of the, the, the deployment is, is very important for sharing and also for preservation. So another issue we have is that if you run the analysis today, the infrastructure and the releases and software will change so much that in, it's not guaranteed that you can reproduce this analysis in three years. And this is quite important for physicists because if you publish a paper and someone sees that this paper in five years, they might want to redo this analysis with some different parameters. And if you have a way to just publish also the, the data of the analysis of how to reproduce, uh, this makes it uh, very powerful. So this is why we have um, this portal called CERN Analysis Preservation. It's an effort that is building a lot on the container to technologies to, to be able to achieve these goals. So a real, what we call a reusable analysis has three pieces. Uh, the workflows you want to use, so the different steps of the analysis. The software that you need, and this is where the Docker images are really key. And then the data you want to access. So in this portal, you just publish all these pieces, and then anyone having access to the portal can go there and just do say, I want to redo this analysis. And they plug into these clusters uh, that we, we are providing and then people can just get the results um, without having to do any uh, custom setup. This is very powerful. So these uh, engines, uh, uh, this is a work in progress, but uh, in this case, it would be a work workflow engine. And in, for this um, case, we are using a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I think th the size of the cluster is something like a couple hundred, uh, it's less than a thousand cores, but it still it already shows uh, quite a lot uh, the potential of the system. So in the engine, you will have multiple levels and different steps on each level. 
And this can be executing in parallel. So we, we've tried parallelizing up to 500 jobs at the same time running. And then each of these steps will run in a Kubernetes container or pod. Um, for this, we exploit a feature in Kubernetes that is less known than um, most of the others, which is a job. So job is a very useful ex abstraction if you want to do this. If, if you want to define a very specific task that should be run, and you don't really care about uh, all the details of pods and the underlying uh, uh, infrastructure, you just abstract what you want to do in a job, and you say, just run this job, and that's it. So what we do is we break the workflow into multiple jobs, and then we throw them to Kubernetes, and we expect that this, the, the Kubernetes handles this. Uh, and we don't have to care about retrials and things like this. Then, because these jobs are independent in, in themselves, but then they, pr they have input data and they produce output data, and this output data is used by other jobs, then we need a, a distributed file system. And again, because we have OpenStack, it was very easy to, to get Manila working. There's a talk tomorrow about the details of how we did this. And we use CFFS as a backend. So this is the system we are using to store the intermediate jobs. Uh, again, we, we are scaling this. Uh, uh, um, and I think the cluster right now has something like 200 nodes. So it's quite, quite large already. Now, this is a visualization of how the workflow, this is a very small workflow, but you can see that there's different steps. And the, the reason I wanted to show this picture is that another benefit you have is uh, to track the execution of these workflows. We've, for many years, we've deployed, we developed our own softwares. Uh, with Kubernetes, all you have to do is just attach to the jobs running and aggregate the logs, and we get the visualization on the bottom of the page there uh, of everything that is happening. This is uh, the, the person uh, developing this portal who was a physicist, and it was quite dramatic, the change from, from the previous systems that he had worked on. Uh, there's a couple of uh, things missing in the wall setup. So one, one is the um, prioritization. So right now in Kubernetes, you have the notion of a job, but you can't really say we, that a job is more important than the other, and this is this is quite relevant for us because uh, you will have different types, types of job. A reconstruction job should be happening before an analysis job, for example. So this is something we'll be trying to work with the upstream Kubernetes to introduce. Um, then the improved job abstraction is that the job abstraction actually has some um, characteristics that we don't really like. Uh, like. It will always retry until it succeeds. And sometimes we just want it to give up. And so, but then it has quite a lot of flex flexibility on implementing your own controllers. So we, we, that's what we did for now. We just built on the existing job abstra abstraction and wrote our own controller to deal with this uh, specifics we need. But this is something that I'm pretty sure will just start appearing in the future. And then the last one I'll mention is interactive analysis. So Jupyter Notebooks are another super popular service uh, at CERN because you don't need any setup at, at all. You just need a browser. And then you do your analysis, um, which is usually either C++ or, or Python, uh, against the data. Again, if you back up the Jupyter instance by a container cluster uh, that has all the integration already done because we deployed it with Magnum, then it makes your life really, really easy. Um, in this case, we actually do more. So in addition to run um, the, the Jupyter Notebook itself in a container, which is specific to that user, we also uh, make the, the, some of the steps in the analysis run in a remote cluster. So if you have one step of your analysis that needs more than one container, then you can say, OK, and this bit should be run in this Spark cluster. And again, the Spark cluster can be deployed using Magnum. Uh, and DCOS, for example. So th this is th all this integration, we are still working on it, but, but it, it, we already have users uh, trying it. I think that's it for use cases. So I'll just finalize uh, with some, some uh, overview of uh, what presents. So this, this Magnum service has been in production at CERN for, uh, for a few months now. Uh, in total, in a couple of months, we got 80, cluster, uh, 80 clusters deployed. Some, some of them have uh, more than 100 nodes already. And it's interesting to see what's, what's the distribution of usage of COEs. This is a question we get a lot, is which one is the most popular. 
Uh, our goal is really not to choose, it's to give users the option to choose themselves. Um, but in, if I checked the numbers yesterday, and we have something like 40 Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we have 20 Swarm clusters. The main use case for these Swarm clusters is the continuous integration with GitLab. And then we have five Mesos and DCOS. So the Mesos driver in Magnum had a lot of features missing, so that's why it wasn't very popular. But recently, we added DCOS. I think it's in review, but we actually already deployed it at CERN. Um, and that it makes it more popular because it has the full stack integrated. So one missing feature that we really need is the upgrades. So this is coming in Pike. Uh, this is an issue for, it wasn't an issue until now because most of these clusters are quite new, but it's an issue when people started saying, I need Kubernetes 1.6 and I need it tomorrow. So uh, this will come very soon. And uh, then we have a few new use cases that we're sure uh, will come. Uh, we've been following the activities at CERN regarding machine learning, and there they need massively parallel executions with the clusters and GPUs. So this is something we'll have to make sure that we can put in Magnum too. And then the second one is federated batch clusters. So we have a very large batch, batch cluster running uh, at CERN, and we have other batch clusters in other sites. But one use case we have is to have spikes. So before conferences, people get very excited and they want to run a lot of analysis. So we need to be able to spike the size of these clusters very quickly. So if we can do something like uh, have a batch cluster running at CERN and then deploy temporarily in a public cloud um, a similar cluster and just federate them, uh, this would be amazing. There's work going on in uh, Kubernetes to allow this. So this is something we'll, we'll be looking at also. And I think that's it. And um, Take so, questions. Yeah, thanks for listening. and. We'll take some questions. Now, Ricardo, while the audience is finding the microphones, I have a question. So you mentioned the absence of priority queuing in Kubernetes as, as a potential drawback to using that for that application. Did you consider using a, uh, a separate Magnum cluster also running Kubernetes for those jobs? Or why did you want them all to be in the same cluster together? Uh, that's, that's, people are used to this. So all our batch clusters have these queuing mechanisms. And uh, we could separate them. But uh, you would still need to do the, the scheduling um, at some point in the application layer. If you split them in multiple clusters, then you still have to have someone deciding, OK, this fast one should be redirected there, this slow, slow one. And uh, it, it probably doesn't give an optimal usage of the clusters also, because if you have low priority jobs only, then that the fast, the, the other clusters might be not so busy. So the ideal thing would be just to merge everything. Hi, gentlemen. Thanks uh, for being here. Scott Fulton from the New Stack. And I, uh, Ricardo, please, I want to start. Pass on to your colleagues at CERN my congratulations and those of my colleagues for what I believe will be confirmed as the first great subatomic discovery of the 21st century, the confirmation of the Higgs boson. I think the meaning of that is not quite understood yet, but I, I, I believe it's brilliant. I followed along, watching online, uh, watching the celebration, and uh, I, I think it is magnificent what, uh, what CERN has done. Uh, it's my understanding that the data centers that uh, CERN uses and that, that it's outsourced, that, that it outsources, are distributed all around Europe. Uh, some, I don't know that there are really any in Switzerland, but I know there are several in France, some in Germany, I think there are some in Poland. Uh, do you have an understanding of the physical locations of those data centers and whether any of that uh, plays any factor in terms of latency or performance with how uh, you, you're able to uh, uh, create clusters in OpenStack? Right, so um, I'll, I'll try to answer. So the, the, we actually have um, a large, it's, it's called, we, we started developing a technology called grid computing a couple, a couple of decades ago, I guess, uh, end of the 90s. And uh, this was the main way we were, uh, we are still using to do physics analysis. So this is a large, um, distributed computing infrastructure that it has hundreds of, a uh, couple hundred sites, so 200 sites, I believe, 
all over, over, all over the world. It's not only in Europe. And we have very fast links between them. And traditionally, this is the way, the way we've been doing things. So what we've been doing is um, when a physicist submits a job, he doesn't really care where it ends up. But we develop these systems that will know where the data is and what is the availability of resources in all of these uh, 200 sites. Uh, they are not all open stack, of course. Uh, they've been deployed uh, since many, many years. Um, but in the end, uh, we do have the knowledge of the physical location of all the sites, but especially the uh, usage of all these res resources. So we can schedule the, the data, the um, execution of the jobs to the appropriate site. Uh, what we do is one of two things, which is similar to what we would do in a local cluster, which is uh, we either ship the job to where the data is, or if that, if that site is very busy, then we'll create a new replica of the data in another site and ship the execution of the job there. So it's a trade-off on uh, time spent flushing, like uh, moving data around and executing the job faster. And if I may follow up, uh, you mentioned that uh, CERN has had to uh, had to roll a few things on its own uh, because of the way Kubernetes handles jobs, for instance. Uh, what does CERN then contribute back to the community that we might we might see further upstream? Right. So regarding Magnum, we've been working a lot with upstream. So in a collaboration with Adrian and. Uh, uh, and Rackspace we, we, and OpenLab at CERN, we started this work upstream in Magnum. So we actually have a person at CERN uh, from this collaboration that has been, uh, uh, became core developer in Magnum and has been contributing all the features that we require internally. So we've been doing this in Magnum. Uh, then there's also these side projects that we've been involved and we require. So things like uh, the integration with Cinder, OpenStack Cinder, uh, we've done contributions to uh, lib storage, which is the library that, um, and Rexray, which is the library that Swarm is using to provide Cinder support. Uh, same for Kubernetes. So we, we've done a couple of patches on the um, OpenStack driver for Kubernetes. So we, we've been working there. And we are reaching out to these communities to, to work further uh, with them, definitely. That's, that's, that worked really well for OpenStack, and we, we, we count on doing the same for, for other projects. Thank you. Yeah. I think we have time for just one more question. OK, sir. Yep. Hi, I have a question about uh, storage. You mentioned the EOS is your main storage. And you did also mention about the Ceph. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understand you have a big Ceph cluster as well. Mm -hmm. Would you mind explaining how those two storage systems are used together right. or differently? Right. And also the deployment and management, is it done somewhat together or? you know, very separate. Right, so the usage is um, right now is that EOS is our main storage system for physics data. So everything that comes from the detectors, raw data or reconstructed data, uh, we store in EOS. So this is a massively parallelized uh, uh, storage system, but has, has very specific characteristics that allows us to scale to hundreds of petabytes. Um, then Ceph we use for uh, Cinder, for block storage. Uh, so that cluster is something like a uh, couple of petabytes, I believe, like five or 10 petabytes, something like that. And we use them for, uh, for the volumes of the VMs, um, so to back up the, the VMs uh, block storage. And then because we have Ceph already, and that's fully integrated with OpenStack via Cinder, uh, we started looking at CephFS and the Manila integration uh, because we have some use cases to have distributed file systems for things that we now use NFS filers for, for this. Uh, so th these are use cases for CephFS. So all these systems are within the same group at CERN, and they are managed in the same way in the sense that they are managed the same way that any other service has, at CERN is managed, which is deployed with Puppet with a common monitoring system. Um, all the tools we have are built in uh, using the same stack so, so that any service manager can move around between services. Yeah. That's great. Thank you very yeah. much. I find it amusing that you just casually mentioned 10 petabytes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much. Thank you.